Why were the authorities so slow to adopt the idea of citrus for scurvy prevention? A clear explanation is not available, but other competing remedies for scurvy were also being proposed, and each such cure had its champions. For example, Captain Cook's reports from his voyages in the Pacific did not provide support for curing scurvy with citrus fruits. Further, Dr. Lind was not a prominent figure in the field of naval medicine, and so his experimental findings did not get much attention in the British Navy. While scurvy prevention was generally resisted for years by the British Navy, other innovations like new ships and new guns were accepted readily, so the Admiralty did not resist all innovations. It also gives a case of the diffusion of hybrid corn in Iowa and boiling of water in third world villages. We'll return now to uh, the ancient engineers. The first engineers were irrigators, architects, and military engineers. The same man was usually expected to be an expert at all three kinds of work. This was still the case thousands of years later in the Renaissance when Leonardo, Michelangelo, Michelangelo and Dürer were not only all-round engineers, but outstanding artists as well. Specialization within the engineering profession has developed only in the last two or three centuries. Now we skip down quite a bit. To protect the wealth of the gods and the kings, military engineers built walls and dug moats around cities. In the lower Euphrates Valley, where there is practically no stone, walls were made of brick, made of mud. Elsewhere they were made of stone, preferably the largest stones that could be moved. Even before mortar was invented, men could build a good solid wall of small stones which would stand up to the weather for years. However, all an enemy had to do to such a wall was to pry out a few stones with his spear and the wall collapsed. Therefore, many early fortifiers made their walls of very large stones trimmed to fit roughly together. The sheer weight of these stones prevented the foe from pulling them out, especially if defenders at the top of the wall were raining missiles upon him. Such walls were called Cyclopean because the ancient Greeks, seeing the ruins of walls of that kind built several centuries earlier, thought they must have been made by the mythical one-eyed giants called Cyclopes. Let me skip a bit. As students of ancient history get the curious impression that during the golden age of Greece, the Greeks were the only people in the world who were really alive. It seems as though the folk of all the other lands were standing around like waxen dummies in a state of suspended animation. Of course, that is not true. During the Golden Age of Greece, all along the main civilized belt, from Spain to China, teeming multitudes toiled and carried on the business of living in quite as lively a fashion as the Greeks were doing. All right. But because the Greeks put their experiences down in writing, and because good luck has saved a small part of these writings for us, we know a lot about them. We know much more, for instance, of the little upcountry brawls of tiny Greek city-states. On the other hand, we know almost nothing about the score of thunderous battles by which Darius the Great and his generals defeated the many rival claimants to the Persian throne. For the same reason, we know quite a lot about Greek and Roman engineering, but very little about ancient Iranian, Indian, and Chinese engineering. In Iran, India, and China, either the subject was not written down, or the writings have perished, or where records have come down, many have never been published in European languages. As nearly as we can reconstruct the evidence, the earliest civilizations were patchworks of little independent city-states ever fighting one another. Let me skip a little bit. Where a river system forms a single large watershed, an irrigation system works better when it is ruled by one central administration. So in certain areas, this early on small villages fighting each other uh, was bound eventually to be worked into a larger system because it's favored by the geography. Thus in the valleys of the Nile, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Indus and the Huang Ho, Conditions favored the extension of one state's rule over all the others in the watershed. Historians argue whether empire came first and made possible large-scale irrigation, or whether large-scale irrigation came first and encouraged the growth of empire. Probably the former is more nearly right, but there was also a mutual effect. Each institution fostered and strengthened the other as it grew. Now, in, in, to the extent that irrigation systems allowed more crops to be grown and the crops to be grown more reliably uh, 
and uh, better crops, you know, m uh, more crops on any given amount of land. To that extent, an empire which had a good irrigation system would tend to be able to grow, be able to afford more things, have higher productivity. So it's a, irrigation system is a tool of productivity. So this is like adding um, massive diesel generators to a third world country and the third world country next door is still using donkeys and manpower. And diesel generators aren't that advanced, but it gives them an absolute world of uh, advantage over their neighbor. And the same thing with any irrigation system of any quality gave them an advantage in productivity, which directly, directly uh, contributed to the lives of the people, the happiness of the people, their, their material comfort. So, one didn't cause the other and the other didn't cause the one. They had to come about together. There's no other way that the larger city-states could have ever formed except by each generation building up and then, you know, step by step by step. But, but let us continue. Skipaways. Under the conditions of early river valley civilization, even a bad emperor might be better than none at all. While men feared cruel and rapacious rulers, even more they feared a time of anarchy. So they had respect for the law way back then. So important was the distribution of water in such a polity that the German-American scholar Wittfogel, W-I-T-T-F-O-G-E-L, refers to a watershed empire of the type we have discussed as a hydraulic state. So now you know what a hydraulic state is. It is not a reference to the temperature of water in a physics problem. Sometimes a watershed empire broke up into parts as a result of domestic disorder or foreign conquest. But, after a few decades of the joys and sorrows of anarchy and incessant strife, the people of the watershed were once more prepared to submit to the rule of an all-powerful emperor. From the rise of the first watershed empires down to the achievement of temporary world mastery by Europe after 1600, Man's history largely consists of the story of the mighty empires that rose in the main civilized belt, spread far beyond the confines of a single watershed, flourished for a time, and withered away. Sometimes they lasted for centuries, sometimes only a few years. Thus the Assyrian Empire gave way to the Median, and that to the Persian, and that to the Macedonian, and that to the Roman, and that to the Arab, and that to the Turkish. A long succession of other empires in Iran, India, China, and Central Asia flourished beside these westerly realms, and many of the rulers of these domains, however good or bad in other respects, were among the world's greatest builders of public works, and therefore the greatest patrons of the engineering profession. For whatever their sins and oppressions, some early despots did much for those they ruled. A king with any brains tries to make his people prosper, if only so that he can tax them. Rulers of ancient empires built roads which fostered commerce and communication. But the principal purpose of these roads, as the governmental postal system that operated over them, was to keep a swift stream of commands and increase flowing out from the capital to all parts of the realm, and an equally lively stream of information and tribute flowing back for the benefit of the ruler. However they might disagree in other matters, a king and his subjects had a common interest in keeping up roads and canals, suppressing brigandage and piracy, and in maintaining order. You know, if it, just reading across the randomest stuff in history, you get again and again and again potent little nuggets about how stupid the idea of non-government is. And there are these people today who pose as educated who uh, call themselves anarchists. All right, we skip a ways. Despite the enormous importance of engineers and inventors in making our daily life what it is, history does not tell much about them. The earliest historical records were made by priests praising their gods and poets flattering their kings. Neither cared much about such mundane matters as technology. As a result, ancient legend and history are one-sided. We hear much about mighty kings and heroic warriors, somewhat less about priests, philosophers, and artists, and very little about the engineers who built the stages on which these players performed their parts. Skipping a bit, great soldiers and statesmen have built up empires, but a few generations later these empires fade away as those they had never been. In the field of government, many people thought half a century ago that 